Hey Tacoma. Hey Tacoma. We are definitely not in the TV classroom We're not in today. the TV classroom today. We're not. We are here on location down at the Point Defiance Marina Boathouse and the Point Defiance Park. And today, we're going to be doing a lot of investigating for all of our grade levels. All of our grade levels. We're going to talk about biomimicry, biodiversity, interdependence, forces in motion. It's going to be amazing. And it we're going is. to see how our whole world works together. Now, just a moment ago, a ferry took off. You can kind of see it in the distance. We're hoping a little bit later we'll be able to look at that ferry and talk about the forces that are being put upon that ferry to get it moved or to make it stay still. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna go down to the beach. We're gonna look and see what we can find in some of the tidal zones. Yeah. We're gonna look and see what kind of animals live in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go up into the forest and we're gonna look and see what kind of animals we can find there and see if we can find any animals we mimic as humans to solve problems. It's gonna be awesome. It's going to be now, awesome. Now, before we begin, you need to make sure you have something to write on. Either your writing journal, a science notebook, I brought my whiteboard and pen so that we can make observations and make them really big so you can see them. I think we should get started. I think so. Are you ready, friends? Before, oh. Oh. Check in. Check in. We have to check in. We're, see, we're so excited. This happens with science. I forget to check in with our zones. I know, it's still important. Let's check in with our zones today. How's your, how your brain feeling? How's your body feeling? How are your emotions feeling? Take a look at the chart give it a moment to think about it. Hmm. Miss no. Allison, how are you feeling? I feel, I'm in the green zone. Mm -hmm. I feel really good to go because again, I feel like this has just been a common theme this week. Like I slept really well last yep. night. I had a good breakfast and being outside with the fresh air oh, and the sunshine so just puts me in the green zone. Good to go. Yep. How are you feeling? I'm mostly in the green zone. My brain is feeling a little jumbled today. And some days we've talked about this, that yeah. my brain sometimes gets jumbled. So if my words come out funny today, I'll just correct them. There we go. But it's a little in the yellowy jumbled zone, but I'm pretty much in the green zone. Okay. So I'm nice. good to go. All right, yeah. friends. We'll see you in the next clip. We started coming up into this forested area because I saw this tree stump over here and it's starting to look decomposed. And in our forest, mm -hmm. we talked about that decomposed tree stump. And so I thought we'd go take a look at it. But then as we were climbing up, Miss Oslin found something. What'd you find, Miss Oslin? Well, as I was walking up, I noticed that there's holes in this hill oh. as we go up. And that made us think that there must be some kind of creature that lives in, there. in that hole. Interesting, yeah, because I see another one here uh -huh. and another one right there. And it's like in a mound. Mm -hmm. So I'm Shall wondering we... if we're right here, right as we go into the forest, what kind of animal Might we would either. see here. Well, if I think about my diagram, on that bottom part of the forest, we saw things like rats. We did. Squirrels. Mice. Chipmunk. Mice. I bet it's some kind of rodent. Mm -hmm would be my guess. And I know that those rodents kind of burrow mm -hmm. underground to live. So that would make sense that they would kind of have a little home all built here. Mm -hmm. Should we go look at that log? Yeah, let's see if we can find some decomposers over there. Yeah, let's go look. There are little pokey burrs that look just like the burrs that were on the dog that helped us figure out Velcro. Velcro. So there's where we mimicked Velcro from was things that are spiky that stick to us that's how they figured it out. I wonder why this plant uses pokey things like that, little spikes hmm, on it. I how wonder. does that help it? I don't know. That's a big piece of bark. Look oh. at that hole in there. Yeah, and then I see a little bug. Do you see that bug in there? He's shiny, he's not moving. As we're doing things today, what we want you to do is to jot down what you see, draw a picture of it, write questions you have, Make predictions. Make predictions about why you think it is or what we might use it for. I wonder, Miss Oz, I'm gonna try and put this back where I found it. I wonder if under this log, if you could pull it up. Now we're being very careful not to disturb nature too much. Right, so notice we're not just coming and moving everything. We're being really aware of where things were because it's these animals' homes. 
Oh, do you know what I'm seeing right here on this log? Is a ton of spider webs. Yeah. I wonder if we need to get deeper into the woods. I definitely see a lot of crawly bugs on this. Oh, can you bring it up to the camera so we can see it? Down in here. Oh, there's it? a worm. A worm. A worm right there. Oh, there's a snail. Oh, look at that snail. So we've seen a bug. We're not sure what kind it is. A worm, a snail. That's three different types of animals just on this log. Think about the diversity of animals here that we've already seen on this log. We've seen an insect. We've seen a slug, a worm. We see plants growing. There's some moss growing here, all on this dead piece of wood that's decomposing. And that's just what we can see. Right, I bet if we had like underneath a microscope, we'd be able to see so much more. But also, I wanna talk about how this slug has mimicked this wood. Look at the color of the slug. It's found a spot in the wood that is the same color. Okay, so what's really interesting is we're climbing up further into the forest. We saw this water, but there's no water up above it. It's just like coming out of the ground. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm thinking about what I know about the water cycle uh -huh. and groundwater and oh. how, first of all, I know about forces is that water is going to flow downward. Right, so it's not gonna go flow uphill. It's not uphill gonna flow uphill. Because gravity pulls it down, so that's a more powerful force, force. than the, the pull up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's gonna flow down. And Mrs. Wally and I were talking about how interesting it is that we have two seemingly very different very ecosystems. Very different ecosystems. But they're clearly connected yes. by this groundwater. So Mr. Kevin's gonna pan down for you and show you where this groundwater is flowing to. Think about how they're similar or different. And then take a look. You can see the wetness on the pavement. That groundwater is flowing into the Puget Sound or the Salish Sea, which we're going to be going there next. Okay, friends, as we're making our way up into the forest, we continue to get stopped and distracted by so many different types of organisms. And as we were walking, we passed this pile of deer scat. And deer was not something that was on our input chart, but deer are certainly a, a great example of a primary consumer. They come along and they eat. And I noticed that there's lots of thorny blackberry bushes and I know deer like berries and they like really um, delicate leaves and flowers. And I know that because they come and eat out of my garden. <laughs> they, they, they eat the apples off our apple trees. Yes. So we have our primary consumer here of our deer and they come down to eat and defecate and then go back up into the forest where they live. And that defecation actually acts as fertilizer for all of these plants to help them grow and be healthy in nutrients for those primary consumers. Those primary so that consumers. the secondary consumers, thinking about a deer, like a bear or a cougar, mm -hmm. might eat the deer. the deer. Yeah. All right, friends, as we were coming up the trail deeper into the forest. We're coming up into a different type of ecosystem up yeah, here. Yeah, we're seeing different things up here than we did down lower. So what I was doing was I was coming up the hill and I saw underneath a fallen part of a tree and there's different types of fungi. They're different colors and they're bigger than what we saw down closer to the water. So I was looking up under here, but then right in here, they're kind of a rust color with white underneath. It's really interesting. And then up on the tree further, right behind Miss Oslin, is another kind. Okay, friends, as we were coming back down the hill, we stopped and we noticed that there's some seashells here in the dirt. And I noticed that the shells are broken up. They're not in whole pieces. But we're not on the beach where the shells would, where the animals within these shells, the clams would have been living. So hmm. take some think time. How do you think these got here?
I'm wondering, I think about animals. I know birds. I've seen birds with like clams in their beaks before. So I'm wondering if they were out there in the ocean, in the Salish Sea, brought them here to eat them away from their predators. Oh. But I also know children really like seashells. Yes. So I'm wondering if some children found them and brought them up. Oh. But they don't look like, I mean, they're all broken up, which makes me think someone was eating. That's what I was thinking. Because children like to collect whole seashells and yeah. put them in a little pile. And then they f them and add them to their treasure boxes. Yeah. So I'm more inclined to think that it was maybe something eating it, mm -hmm. which now is bringing part of that ecosystem into this one. So there's an interdependence between the forest and, and the, the sea. sea. Here we are at the high tide zone over the Salish Sea. And as Mrs. Wally and Mr. Kevin and I were walking, we saw this rock. And we noticed that it has some sort of plant, several different types of plants growing off it. Yep. But also, if you'll remember, barnacles. Barnacles. So friends, here on this bulkhead wall in the high tide zone, on the wall, you can see some of the different types of barnacles. And then right here, it's so small. So small. But it's the periwinkles. It's amazing. And you can see all the barnacles, some are open, some are closed. You can also see some of the plant life. And then we saw these little shells and they move when I, they were, you can move them and when I touched them, then they like suck down onto the wall further. I'm gonna do some investigating of what that creature is because I don't know what it's called. So if you can figure it out, awesome, send it into us and I'm gonna do some research. And during our next, fifth graders during our next time, I will let you know what those are called. But they're really cool and sometimes they like squirt water out. Yeah, that was neat. You can see water dripping down from this one. I can get any. Oh, that one's this starting one. to drip water. Yeah. See? Interesting. I don't want to disturb them too Ooh. much. That squirted. Yeah, so it's protecting itself. Yeah, it's it is. Pretty amazing. This reminds me of suction cups. Yes! I'm thinking about how these are stuck to the wall, and I'm thinking about how the force must be pulling it down. Yeah. But it's not because it's stuck. I wonder if this is where we got the idea for suction cups. Biomimicry. If not, it would be another way to find that. That's amazing. Great connection, Miss Oslin. <laughs> Hi friends, here we are at the Point Defiance Marina. And we wanted to point out this sign here. It says, keep wildlife wild that feeding can lead to human injury, animal overpopulation and disease. Feeding is illegal. We encourage you to come down here and yes. enjoy this free park. There's many around Tacoma, but it's very important that you encourage and allow the animals to exist in their own natural environment and not interrupt the interdependence that's happening with the animals in their food chains by not feeding them. And also leaving them here so yes. that everyone's here to enjoy them. We've been really careful while we've been out here. If we moved some moss, we put it right back where we found it. We didn't want to trample on things. We were very careful about where we walked. So when you come to investigate and see all this biodiversity, which is amazing, make sure that you're also being a good steward of that and caring for it. Friends, thank you so much for joining us here down at our Point Defiance Park in Tacoma. 
we are, again, we're gonna encourage you to come down here and explore all of the forces, the biodiversity. See if you can find some biomimicry, like what we oh, might have yeah. mimicked. Yeah, thinking about the Salish Sea and the interdependence of the different organisms and ecosystems. Come explore. And before we leave, we need to do our affirmation. Oh my goodness. Our affirmation today, we did I Am A Scientist this week, and today I just want to reinforce that I can be observant. Yes. I can go out into the world and see nature and see science all around me. So let's all take a deep breath and say that together. I, I can, can be, be observant. observant. Excellent job today, all of our kindergarten through fifth grade friends. We hope you have a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you back here next time in our TV classroom. Bye friends. Bye. Hi, welcome back with art to Art with Miss Teresa. So today we're going to be doing uh, drawings of bears and we're going to be talking about realistic bear anatomy and we're also going to be talking about um, how to draw a teddy bear. So I wanted to show you guys some examples of something that I was working on. So this was my bear drawing but I had it submerged in water because sometimes when bears are hunting um, salmon, which they can eat up to 40 of them a day, and I, I think that's kind of amazing because it would be kind of fun to be able to eat 40 meals in a day. Um, but bears are also territorial, so I have these two bears that are related to each other. Um, they're getting the salmon that are jumping out of the water and they're also using both their teeth and their paws because I think it would be super hard if somebody was throwing uh, pieces of bread at me if I could only use my teeth. So I think that that's a pretty neat tr trait. And so I have a bear here in the foreground and then I have some bears here in the background. So that's an example of my drawing. And then what I did was I made a copy of just this part so that I can put it in different environments. And if you wanted to, you could actually uh, continue the drawing where you draw the rest of the bottom of the bear. Okay. So this is what it looks like, all colored. And black bears come in all sorts of colors, and we'll go into that in a little bit. So sometimes black bears will also be brown. Here's my original drawing. And the copy that I made, I gave it an arm. And I kind of made this fun activity of the bear trying to catch salmon. That's so cute. <laughs> that is awesome. Nice job, Miss well, Teresa. Thank you. And I'm actually going to give this um, to your other teachers so that we can have it on file. And if you guys want to continue the drawing or color it. And so, Mr. Kevin, if you wouldn't mind putting uh, that bear picture up. Okay, so I was hiking on Mount Rainier and I brought my camera and I was lucky enough to be able to see a black bear and it was just foraging for food. And um, I had enough distance between me and the bear to be able to take the pictures, but bears are wild animals. So we don't go up to them and pet them. We don't try to get in their space. Um, we don't want them to feel threatened. So I stood very quietly and um, took my pictures. And then I waited for the bear to move along. Did you have a question, Mr. Kevin? <laughs> I did, Miss Teresa. Now, what the students may not know mm -hmm. about Miss Teresa is she's also a professional photographer. So that bear was probably quite a distance from you because you had a camera lens that could capture at yep. a great distance, right? 
Yeah, so I have a, a telephoto lens, which means that my lens is about this big and my camera is about this big. And so yeah. it kept me at a safe distance away from the bear. And um, I wanted to respect its space and keep myself safe at the same time. But that was a very fortunate thing. The bear was eating berries and um, it ended up walking down the hill and away from uh, the people that I was with. Okay, so we're gonna go into drawing. Okay, so I made a photocopy of that picture and one of the things that I thought was would be kind of neat is to color on top of a actual picture. So I got it in black and white and then I colored the vegetation around it green and then I colored the bear brown and I made sure that I traced the bear so that I knew exactly where I was going to be coloring. So my bear kind of pops out in the photo. Alrighty. So let's do a factoid. Um, black bears are the smallest of the three bear species found in North America. Black bears can range from 50 to 80 inches from nose to tail. So I'm 66 inches because I'm five foot six. So I would be a pretty medium sized bear. On all fours, they are the height of two to three feet. And like brown bears, black bears exhibit gender dysmorphism with males being larger than females. So like when you see them out and about and you see some of them together, you might um, think one is larger, so it's the male and one is smaller and that's the female. But if you're gonna see a cluster of bears together, it's more likely to be a mama bear with her babies because uh, male bears tend to travel by themselves. And, uh, and it says male bears tend to be anywhere from 20 to 60% larger than female bears. So that, that's a pretty big size difference. And it says um, male bears generally weigh between 125 and 500 pounds while female weigh in at about 90 pounds to 300 pounds. So Miss Teresa kind of weighs in the middle of the female bear range. So I would be a, a medium sized bear. But the heaviest bear on record was found in North Carolina in 1998, weighing in at 880 pounds. That is a very, very big bear. All righty. Oops. So, I was looking on the internet for basic bear shapes and this shows the structure of what a bear looks like on the inside. So if you want to do it this way where you get a pencil and then draw these shapes, it gives you kind of the foundation of how you want to be able to draw your bear later. So I just really thought this was super neat that somebody took the time to do all of these shapes. Ms. Teresa, I have another question. Sure. That grid that is, is on that, that picture, mm -hmm. did you draw that grid? I did not. I found it online. I looked up um, how to draw bears. Uh huh. And if you look under images, then all this stuff kind of pulls up. And the thing you wanna do when you're printing is not to try to make the image bigger because you'll lose resolution and it looks fuzzy. So I tried to print them at their normal size. But fuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy was, was a bear. What was it? Fuzzy, wuzzy, was a fuzzy, bear. Fuzzy, 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 wuzzy, had no hair. Fuzzy, wuzzy, wasn't fuzzy, wuzzy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so here's a little more detail. Isn't that amazing? So what you would do is after you draw this part with pen, you would take your eraser and erase all of these lines. And you guys might be watching this on your TV channel, but this information is also available on YouTube. Uh, if you subscribe, you'll be able to get access to all of the videos. Well, you can get access to all the videos by um, doing a search on it, but it's, KTPS classroom. And so you can go back and pause these videos. So if you need more time to work on your project, 
um, you can do it there. Is that right, Mr. Kevin? Absolutely. Cool beans. Okay. So, and here's the body of the bear. And these are all images that I found online. And here's what the bear looks like complete. And then when you erase all of the underlines. So what I did for my drawing of my bear is that um, I do a lot of free-handed drawing. So I was looking at the picture of the bear that I took the photo of and I was using it as reference for this bear. But since this is still a juvenile bear, which means that he's kind of skinny, he hasn't really been around long enough to get his fat layer going. Um, I wanted to make it an adult bear where it's had plenty of time to eat. So when you're, when a bear is about to hibernate, which means to go into a really long sleep, they do this thing called hyperphagia. And Miss Teresa does this thing called hyperphagia too in the winter months where all I want to do is eat and eat and eat. And I get a nice healthy coat <laughs> uh, to keep me warm in the winter. And um, mama bears especially will need to eat lots and lots of salmon and berries and um, other parts that are part of their diet so that when they have their babies, that their babies can survive and be healthy and um, the life cycle starts all over again. But babies are born during that time. Um, so it's super important for us to be able to take care of the environment that animals live in and um, have a healthy salmon population because if one of these bears is eating 40 of them a day, that's, that's a lot. That's a couple hundred pounds. So, um, it's our job to conserve and to leave them alone and observe. So if we're out and about on a hike, keeping a safe distance away, uh, you can take a picture, but be very quiet and leave the wild animals alone. Okay. So. This picture shows the bears in different positions. And I thought that this one was pretty interesting. Um, can we get a zoom in on this little guy right here? Okay, so you'll notice that the bear is on two legs. And when, when you're on two legs, and that's your normal way of walking, that's called bipedal. But bears don't go around walking on two legs generally. Um, it's, it's more of a, I'm trying to make myself bigger to scare you, um, or I need to be able to see. And sometimes you'll see uh, dogs and cats do this too, where they'll stand up on their back legs, but they're not really designed to do that for a very long time. So, but bears are huge in their shoulder blades because they're walking around on their paws. And so they need to build up those muscles. Like if you were to exercise a lot in just one part of your body, it would also make those muscles really, really big. I think that um, bears are pretty amazing. So some of the things that we're gonna talk about in this class is um, the different kind of bears, the different size of bears. And we're also gonna talk about when two different kind of bears have babies together. And so that happens in captivity, which means that they are uh, in an enclosure that's artificial, like a zoo, or they're out in the wild. And that would be uh, in nature. So it has happened both ways. Okay. So I have a lot of material for this particular one because I thought it was really neat. So there's no such thing as too much reference material. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to make a semi-realistic teddy bear. So I'm going to take some of the real attributes, the things that the bear naturally has, and we're going to make it kind of into a stuffed animal. 
Does that sound like a good thing? Yeah. Okay. So if you want to start with pencil, you can, or if you want to go straight to pen, it's completely up to you. Okay. So bears, their eyeballs are facing forward. And that's because they're a predatory animal. And so we're going to draw eyeballs. And we can make start with the iris. So we're going to make a circle. And then since it's a reflective surface like glass, um, we're going to make a little bit of a shine. So another circle. And I always like to make a second little circle. And then I'm going to make the pupil. And the pupil is that black part that goes small and larger, depending on how much sunlight comes in. So one of the facts that I read about bears is that they tend to forage um, at dusk and dawn. And although bears are active all times of the day, that tends to be their eating time. And it was a lot of fun doing research on these because I think that no matter what, becoming a lifelong learner is super important because you're never going to know everything and it's fun to find new facts that you wouldn't know. Okay, so. Okay, I have a little bit of a curve for a bear's eyelid. Now, bear, bears have skin, but they have a lot of fur on top of their skin. So what we're going to do is kind of make kind of squiggles on top here so that you could tell that it's a furry animal and make a bottom lens and eyelashes aren't just for decoration they're actually uh, they keep stuff out of your eyeball And although bears don't have this, um, nictating lenses are cool too because um, it's like a second lens that goes um, over the eye to keep it protected. So it's kind of like eyelashes, just, you know, slimier. Frogs have those, right? Yeah. Okay. So we are symmetrical. So I'm going to draw another eyeball over here. So I'm gonna make kind of a baby bear. One of my favorite bears is Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie the Pooh was actually named after a bear that was in a zoo that Christopher Robin used to visit, the real Christopher Robin used to visit. And, but I believe that that bear was actually a girl. And, Winnie the Pooh is a boy, but they named their character after that bear at the zoo. And while Miss Teresa was on vacation this weekend, I found a first edition copy of Winnie the Pooh. And so that came home with me. Okay, so we're going to draw um, the bear's nose. And so at the end of the nose, it kind of looks like a dog. And so it, it kind of goes up and down. And it's a little bit darker than the rest. And um, since the nose is sticking out, we're going to need some kind of line that shows that there's a crease right here. And I'm gonna make a little bit of a crooked W for the mouth. Okay, so when um, people make characters like Winnie the Pooh, they're personifying them. So Winnie the Pooh doesn't act like a wild animal. He does eat honey and wild um, bears love honey but it's kind of a treat for them. They don't uh, eat that every day and they definitely don't wear clothes. 
but there's other personified bear characters like Yogi Bear and Smokey the bear. And I don't know if you've seen him on TV, but he says only you can prevent forest fires. And they had actually based that character on a little bear that they saved from a forest fire. So I thought that that was kind of a cool tie-in. Okay. All right. So we're going to make it have an open mouth. And since, since we have this crease right here, um, and so do bears, because bears have lips. It's kind of an, a little U. All right. And then the top of the bear's head. He's got a little smile. He does have a little smile. And um, bears will make all sorts of weird facial expressions. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing that humans do. Uh, sort of like when a monkey is smiling uh, or showing its teeth to you, it's it's not a smile. It's a, it's a defense thing. And anytime you see an animal's teeth, it's probably a, I'm trying to scare you away kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, my favorite part of a bear is their ears because they're so cute. So I'm going to make my bear have little fuzzy ears. And then since we're asymmetrical, it's going to have another ear. And you don't have to rush through your drawing. You can take as much time as you want. OK. So just like when we were drawing the baby faces, the eyeballs are kind of in the middle. And the bear is going to have some cheeks. And I'm making my bear have lots and lots and lots of fur. And some top hair, too, because they are covered with it. So bears come in all sorts of um, shapes and colors. And let's see. I just need to get my notes. It said that bears, black bears subspecies come in black, brown, cinnamon, so kind of a light brown. And um, one of the bear hybrids is called a pizzly. And so it's when a polar bear and a grizzly bear get together and have a baby. So the coloring of a pizzly is white and brown, but it looks like a grizzly bear. And the um, polar bear is usually the mom. And that only happens when their habitats overlap. So if it gets, if a bear is wandering, and another bear end up in the same territory, they'll um, have the potential to become mates and become the father and mother of a hybrid bear. So this does happen in nature, but it's very rare because bears tend to stay in their environments and their habitats, and um, grizzly bears tend to stay where it's warmer, and um, polar bears tend to stay where their environment is cooler, which is why they're also white. They blend in with their environment for camouflage. And um, I have a thing for hybrid animals. I think that they're kind of neat because they're rare. Do you have any questions so far, Mr. Kevin? No, I was just going to mention, though, that I had read recently that, that there is an increase right now in uh, the hybrid bears because Polar bears are, their environment is shrinking. It is. Yeah. And um, as people expand their territory, um, sometimes wildlife will come into like the human environment. And bears, 
bears aren't strictly just um, eating fish and berries. They will eat anything edible. And so that might mean that they're digging through dumpsters or in picnic areas because things smell delicious to them and they want to have a quick meal. Um, it takes a lot of effort and energy to hunt and forage. And so sometimes you'll see a bear um, where it's not supposed to be. And then you'll call animal control. And so these people are trained to um, safely remove animals where they don't belong to keep both humans and animals safe. Okay. So I'm making my bear have like a little bit of um, black. Black fur. And then when I color it, it's going to be brown. But if you want your bear to be any color because this is kind of a toy bear, then go right ahead because Winnie the Pooh is yellow. Okay. So I'm going to make a bow because oftentimes you'll see uh, teddy bears with a bow around their neck. Winnie the Pooh wore a red shirt too. He did. And he ate a lot of honey. Mm -hmm. So... Now you can make your bow any way you want to. Um, I like mine to look kind of like a present. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is have my bear having its arms in front of it, and then its legs are gonna be sticking out. So one thing that I thought was really cool about uh, bear paws is that they have the same types of pads on their feet that dogs do and wolves. And I was thinking about this. If I was running around or walking around on rocks and dirt and stuff without shoes on, my feet would get really messed up. But if I had pads like shoes, it would be much easier to be walking around out in that environment. So that is definitely a cool physical trait to have. And uh, they also have very, very sharp claws and they're not retractable claws. So like when a cat um, is being defensive, its claws will come out, but bears have their claws out all the time. So they're super powerful, they're super sharp, and um, they're for self-defense from other animals, they're from trying to catch salmon so that they can eat, and they're for digging. So that's, that's a pretty useful trait to have. Okay, I'm gonna draw the shoulders of my bear. And I'm going to give my bear little itty bitty claws because I'm being semi-realistic. And you won't see claws on a lot of teddy bears, but they'll be nice and soft and squishy. Okay. And then since this is a baby bear, I want it to have a nice, big, fat, healthy stomach. And to be healthy, um, animals need to become as heavy as they can, as fast as they can. And before um, hibernation happens, a bear will eat and eat and eat. It's kind of like being its own refrigerator. It won't have the opportunity to have those meals and feeding schedules because everything will be frozen and other animals are, are migrating to places that it's warmer, but bears tend to stay in their territory. So their survival technique is that they will eat as much as they can for as long as they can, and then they're going to go to sleep. And they don't go into a true sleep where, um, like you would at night, but they go into um, very decreased activity. So they're only awake as they need to be. And their alarm clock is going to be when the weather gets warmer and they know that it's safe to come out. But by the time that they come out, they've already had their babies, um, that they're 
uh, fat reserves are now deplenished, so they need to eat and eat again. And that's why sometimes when you see bears come out of hibernation, they'll be skinny and their fur will be hanging and their job is to eat and do that cycle all over again. So, all right. So I'm going to draw the bottom of feet. So my bear is going to have, again, little claws. And it's gonna have pads on the bottom of their feet. And and it's completely okay if your picture doesn't look like mine. Um, I've been drawing for a very long time and everybody's art is completely unique. If you want to make the bear uh, more realistic or if you want to make it look more like a teddy bear, that's completely okay. But I don't want you to ever get discouraged because you compare your art to somebody else. Your art is supposed to be um, how you see the world and how you want to make it your own. Okay. So a bear has a tiny cotton ball looking thing for a tail. It does not have a long tail like a dog. And I, I think that they're super cute. Um, remember when we talked about what's cute is how close it is to a circle. So bears bottoms have uh, cute little tails and then their ears are also round. And that's probably why they were chosen also to be a popular um, stuffed animal for children. There is a story about one of our, let's see, let's see if I can find it in my notes, um, why it's called a teddy bear. And um, this might be something that I have to look up later, but I'm pretty sure it was Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he, he couldn't shoot the bear and so they made a toy of a bear and then it became a very popular children's item and so i i think that that's that's kind of awesome because it's like yeah. he decided to do the gentle route and um yeah i i my first toy was a teddy bear and i had that thing forever and at one point it had half its stuffing and one eye but it was something that I loved and I could cuddle with and mama bears cuddle and love their baby bears and it's rare for mama bears to have like one cub so they'll they can have like four cubs at a time and can you imagine uh looking after four of your siblings or uh four toddlers or four babies and and they're naughty they they want to explore and they want to climb things and they're discovering the world, but the mama bear's job is to make sure that they stay nice and safe. And uh, bears are all over the place too. So we have them here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we tend to have the black bear. So the black bear can also be brown and cinnamon in color, but you'll see um, different types of bears all over the world. And if you want to go into a deep dive when you're researching, it's kind of cool to uh, see the different features and adaptations of their environment that might be unique to one bear species opposed to another. Okay, so I have babbled a long time about bears. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a quick color on um, my picture. So I'm gonna go red for the bow I'm going to have the bear have brown eyes, and then I'm going to have um, brown skin for, or brown fur for the bear. I think that it would be really, really cool to be able to um, go back to the bear's natural habitat and be able to film them. But it also takes a lot of patience because you don't know where a bear is going to be at any given time. So. So if you were to see a bear, it is super important 
that you keep yourself and the bear safe at all times. So we can observe, but do not interact. And um, yeah. Sometimes when I'm perusing the internet, I've seen uh, pictures of bears sitting at picnic tables. And I think that that's super funny. And so the bear snout is a little bit on the round side. So I'm gonna make this part just a little bit darker. I look forward to seeing your guys' drawings. If you can, um, please send them to us either by email or in the physical mail. You can have a big person help you copy it and scan it and then attach it and then email it. Miss Teresa, we have a new way too that uh, students can send in their drawings and that's using an app called Flipgrid. Well, that's awesome. Can you explain how they do that? Well, I'm kind of sorry that you asked that because I don't know the particulars and the TV teachers could fill us in. Uh, but uh, Flipgrid basically is an application uh, that uh, you have on your computer okay. and the students are already using the app uh, for some of their assignments. Okay. And so they can send in uh, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a picture of a drawing or- Like an attachment? Like an attachment. Mm -hmm. That would be way cool. I would very much like to see your guys' art. Um, and we can even show them on one of our shows. You can show off your art skills. Mm -hmm. Did you know that we have a special art school called SOTA, which is Tacoma School of the Arts? And so its focus is mostly art. Um, it could be dance, it can be musical instruments, it could be drawing. And that if you're interested in art now, that might be something that you may want to look into doing when you're at the high school level. So one of my kids went to Tacoma School of the Arts and she really enjoyed it. Okay, so I'm gonna make my bear completely brown. And here's his big old happy belly. And I don't think that I um, have spent so much time coloring since I was a kid. And I have to say, I find it very relaxing. And so I think that if you're feeling stress, maybe you're not feeling so good inside that taking a break to do art can help you manage your stress and use that energy to create something new. What do you think? The TV teachers and I agree. <laughs> okay, so I am almost done with the legs. And there's there's a lot of bare body here to to color. Now another thing you can do is actually start by drawing on brown paper. And then when you're done, you can cut it out like around its body. And if you wanna do some fun things like my little puppet show here where we're showing the bears trying to get at the salmon, then you can do that. Okay, my little bear nose is going to be even darker than the skin around it. I've really enjoyed talking about bears today. Um, there was so much information out there that if you wanted to, you could always do a report. 
and then do a drawing to go along with your report. But I found a lot of interesting facts about bears and their behavior. All right, so my bear coloring is pretty much done. I am going to get the red and I'm going to color my ribbon. Mr. Kevin, what's your favorite kind of bear? Well, when I was a kid, I had a teddy bear uh, and he was bigger than I was when <laughs> I was little. And I loved my little bear buddy for a long time. Yep, he was, a, he was a good friend. I like that. Yeah. I think one of my favorite bears is Teddy Ruxpin. Oh yeah, I forgot about Teddy Ruxpin. And um, he had he had a place where you could put cassettes, mm -hmm. and we don't use cassettes anymore for um, toys. But it would make him talk, mm -hmm. and I thought that that was really neat. And so whenever I wanted to hear a story, Teddy Ruxpin would be able to tell it to me, and um, I had a whole bunch of tapes that I could put inside the bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neat. Well, today's kids, they can they can watch a video if they want. Uh, when when I was little, I had a record player and I had a Winnie the Pooh album. Oh, and did I you? And I would play the album and read along with the book. Oh, that's that's always really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading my notes, but when I was a kid, I was pretty scared to read out loud because I didn't speak English first. And so I was always worried on how I would sound, but practicing um, reading out loud from storybooks is a great way to improve your skills so that when you are um, put in the situation where you're going to be doing that or talking, that you feel more comfortable with it. But I like having my notes because it helps me organize my thoughts because there's so much I want to be able to tell you in our time together. Okay, so just a little bit of detail coloring. And then the pads of their feet tend to be a different color. So what do you think of the drawing? We love it. <laughs> I, I really like you know, I didn't know this, Miss Teresa, but you can you color over other colors. Mm -hmm. You know, usually when I think of crayons and coloring, I think of just one color and no cover colors overlapping. But you make it look great. Thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna name our bear, and so I think I'm gonna call him Barry, but I'm going to <laughs> spell it like the human name of Barry. Okay. So this is B-A-R-R-I-E. And if you spell Barry a different way than that, that's completely okay too. Um, people spell my name differently. Sometimes they add an H. And so Barry the Bear. Wonderful. Little heart. Thank you for drawing with us today and uh, hope to see you next time. Bye. <laughs>